Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of emotions. The interview was held on the 30th of April 2014 in Willsdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session four, part one. Hi everyone. Welcome today to session four of our discussions our, and answers to frequently asked questions surrounding the topic of emotions. If you're just tuning into this session, we'd like to remind you that there's some really good introductory material that we've already covered that will give context to what we're going to discuss today. Um, so if you would refer to the series on how the human soul functions, there's a number of sessions in that series and you'll find that information pretty useful uh, if you're interested in the topic of emotions and how to deal with them productively and constructively. So I'm with Jesus today and he's going to answer my uh, many and varied questions that we've received from people in our frequently asked questions mm. email box. Mm. Thanks baby. Well, our first question today comes from Daniel mm -hmm. and he says, how do I actually process my emotions? The past couple of months have been somewhat tragic. A lot of things have happened. Loss of a friend, made a few bad choices that I now think back and go, wow, that was stupid. <laughs> but I still have a lot of grief and guilt and I'm a bit unsure by what you mean when you say processing emotions. Mm. Well, firstly, the whole terminology processing emotions um, is probably, it's better to say, how do I feel my emotions? Because yep. once you feel and experience your emotions, you are processing through your emotions. So when we talk about processing emotions, we're really saying that it's processing through emotions. In other words, going through the process of feeling lots and lots of different emotions mm -hmm. to actually process an emotion, mm -hmm. you need to feel it, you need to experience it, you need to let yourself experience it and feel it. So that's quite simple uh, in terms of an answer. Now obviously Daniel's question has got a lot more complexity in it than that, but, but if we look at the issue of, of feeling or experiencing your emotions, the main problem we have is, in, in Daniel's case, it's the same problem that he has, and that is we're, we're often not very sensitive to our emotions. Yeah. And we're also not very sensitive to allowing them to flow, to allowing them to be present, to allowing ourselves to experience them. So whenever traumatic events occur, so he's lost a friend, he said, I think, and yep. made some bad decisions that he feels regretful and guilty <laughs> about yep. as well. These kind of, <coughs> the fact that these things have happened, I just need to have a cough. The fact that these things have happened are they, they are law of attraction events. So, so in other words, his soul is in a certain condition and then it's attracting events that would cause him under normal circumstances if he was sensitive yeah. to feel specific emotions that are within his soul. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the events are being attracted is an indication that these particular emotions must exist in his soul, otherwise he wouldn't attract the events. Right. So, so we need to examine then why it is that he's not being able to feel the events. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever we can't feel, there's only a few reasons why we can't. One is that we're in complete denial of our feelings. In other words, we spend most of our time trying to shut down our feelings. Two is that we revert to anger-based positions. Or three, that we have a lot of addictions in play. So if someone's not feeling their emotions, uh, through, particularly through traumatic events, mm -hmm. the key is to look at the different belief systems that create addictions uh, that are in play or to look at the particular belief systems, emotional belief systems that create denial of emotion. And this requires, again, a use of our will. Mm -hmm. So we've emphasized over and over during these sessions that our will must be engaged. So what I'm suggesting to Daniel is that his will is not engaged to, to feel emotion at this point. Yeah. His will instead is engaged to deny emotions, to suppress emotions, to resist emotions or substitute emotions. Mm -hmm. So that's how he's currently using his will. Now, we only use our will along those lines because of belief systems that we have inside of us. Belief systems such as, it's pointless feeling my emotion. It's better if I avoid my emotion. Uh, if I feel my emotions, I'll get punished, and so forth. Yeah. We need to examine 
the belief systems inside of ourselves. And again, this is an exercise of our will. Mm -hmm. So what is our emotional feelings that we have about feeling emotions? Yeah. So, so what do we really feel about having to experience our own emotions? Yeah. Now, this is where we start to see the fears involved that, that begin to be exposed once we start this examination process. So, so someone like Daniel probably thinks that he has very little fear, mm -hmm. but the reality is there must be a lot of fear about emotion. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, he would already be feeling his emotion, particularly if he lost a good friend uh, through mm -hmm. death or whatever, there'd probably some emotions come up there. And the fact that he's shut down towards them means that he's probably not feeling them. Yeah. And that means that he must have fears and he's probably suppressing his fears with some addictions. Yeah. And, and this helps him avoid. And the only way you can get through all of that is to, is to use your will to change what you do. Yeah. So that's the only thing I've been able to do. Your, if your will is actively engaged in trying to suppress emotion, there is very little emotion that you'll actually ever find. You need to change your will. And that's about changing some of your belief systems. And it's also about desire. If, if we have little desire to connect to God or little desire to become our true self, then of course we will actively resist most of our emotions. And so it, again, it gets down to the development of a real pure, wholehearted, sincere desire to connect to God and connect to ourselves and a real pure, wholehearted, sincere desire to feel and express what we really feel at all times. Mm -hmm. And most people don't have those two desires. And so that's something that we would need to learn how to develop. Now, one of the main reasons why we don't have those desires is because our fear prevents us from having desires. Mm -hmm. So again, it's only fear that usually prevents us from developing desires that are good for us. And it's also fear, uh, fear indicates generally that there are many false beliefs. So I, if I was Daniel, I would also examine my false beliefs about God, false beliefs about emotions, false beliefs about fear, mm -hmm. and so forth that I have. Because with, it, when you get into a state of truth with regard to your past, you know, your life up to this point, and your truth about the decisions that you've made that you regret, mm -hmm. then you will easily connect to the emotions that those particular truths bring up. Mm -hmm. When we deny the truth, we will resist our emotions mm -hmm. quite strongly. And so he's obviously doing that as well, particularly with regard to the issues revolving around the things that he feels bad about, that he, cho that he made some bad decisions in the yeah. past few months. So that, that are the main things that he would need to do. Now, what I find is that most people, when they're told that, they want to be told how to do that. But the reality is when you have desire to do it, you work out how to do it you actually engage a process where you are sincere about finding out the truth about yourself. And once that happens, then the truth about yourself comes at you quite rapidly mm -hmm. through all sorts of events. You attract it through the, the law of attraction. So your soul, as soon as you enter the state where you really want to know the truth, you have a lot of events happening around you that tell you the truth quite rapidly. And so that's one way of finding out the truth if you really wanted to know it. The other thing is that you'd be open to the feedback from others. And I find a lot of people say, oh, you know, I want to get into my emotions, but then you tell them one thing about their emotions and they're in complete denial about that particular emotion, which means that they're not open to any feedback. They're not being humble to mm -hmm. any feedback from the universe around them or from other people which might help them. Yeah. If you're truly sincere about dealing with your emotions, you do not care where the information comes from you allow the information to come to you and then you w attempt to go through it emotionally. So, so when it comes to processing these emotions, yeah. all we need do is experience them. The problem is getting to the point of experiencing them for most yeah. people. So um, just a little bit of theory then. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we talked about this a bit in how the human soul functions, mm -hmm. but, but in this, you know, talking about feeling our emotions fully or processing emotion. Um, what does it mean? Say I'm Daniel mm -hmm. and my friend passes and I go to the funeral and I have a bit of a cry 
Um, well, I suggest that Daniel probably didn't even do that, <laughs> but, but go, go on. <laughs> I suppose what I'm asking about is where, where we find the difference between uh, what it means to be a bit emotional and what it means to actually process an emotion and how we know we've processed an emotion. What, what, what are we referring to when we talk about those kinds of things? The problem with answering these kind of questions that you've just asked, I feel, is that it intellectualises a process that is emotional. Yeah. And the big problem that most people have is that they're using their head too much and <laughs> just not allowing themselves to feel what they actually feel. Yeah. The reality is if you went along to a funeral of your friend and you had a connection with your friend and you had some false beliefs about death and so forth in you, which almost all of humanity does have, you would get into sadness at the funeral. Now, most people don't because they they're they str struggling to hold back the sadness. Mm -hmm. so, so I feel the struggle to hold back the sadness is not going to be helped now by an intellectual discussion about you know, emotion and how sure. it works and everything. The, the, there needs to be a willingness developed in the soul, which is an emotional willingness developed in the soul through the exercise of your own will, to feel your own emotions. And if you can't feel your own emotions, it is because of all the emotional feelings that are in your soul that are unwilling mm -hmm. to feel emotion. Mm -hmm. And what I would do is sincerely look at my unwillingness. So rather than trying to force myself into be willing, yes. I would look at why I'm unwilling yeah. to feel my emotions. Yeah. And the question uh, that I'd ask Daniel is things like, um, how bad does your life have to get before you're going to feel an emotion, mm. right? That's a very a good question to ask yourself because for most people it has to get very, very bad before they'll feel an emotion. Yeah. And remember what we're trying to do is increase our emotional sensitivity, not increase our desensitivity. Mm. But the majority of people through their life increase their desensitivity to emotion. So, so, and the only thing that breaks through that is that is the law of attraction bringing more and more difficult events. Now, how hard do the events have to be before you're going to feel them? So, so if it's the death of a friend, it, what's the next death that's going to have to happen before you feel something? Maybe it's the death of a spouse or a child or something in your family before you'll start feeling some of that kind of grief. Wouldn't it be better to just begin to look at the blockages you have to feeling that grief mm. rather than just saying, oh, well, I can't feel, let's move on to the next nasty event that happens yeah. and see how, how I go feeling that one. Yeah. Um, if we have a really sincere desire to feel, what I've found myself is that you can easily access your emotion, um, but you must exercise your will in that direction mm -hmm. first. And the majority of people, if they look at what they do during the course of the day, they don't exercise their will to feel emotion at all, generally. The course of the day, normally most people are engaging in activity which suppresses their emotion, engaging in activity that feeds their addiction so that their emotions can be suppressed, or trying to keep busy, which is another activity mm -hmm. to suppress emotion and it's another addiction. They have very little focus in their day-to-day -day activity of actually spending time each day to discover how they actually feel about the things that are happening in the course of the day and feel about the things that are happening that have happened in the past. And very, li very few people have a sincere desire to actually do that. And that's the reason why the majority of people are really struggling when it comes to divine truth. Because unless you do that, you don't really have a sincere desire to connect to God. Mm -hmm. You don't really have a sincere desire to connect to yourself. And so it's highly uh, unlikely that you'll actually experience any improvement on a path that requires all of those things from you. Yeah. Now, remember, this is the way God created it to be. So in other words, you're never going to experience any improvement on the way God created it to be unless you're willing to go through this process. And your willingness will depend very much on your desire to look at your unwillingness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In other words, you've got to find all the reasons emotionally inside of you as to why you're so unwilling to feel what you're actually feeling mm. and what's actually present and what you're attracting. Yeah. And so that's where I would start if I was Daniel, to yeah. look at all of the ways that he doesn't like the idea, <laughs> not that he likes the idea, because it's very plain he does not like the idea from a soul level, otherwise he will already be feeling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even in his statements there, he's judging himself, isn't he? He's, he's calling himself stupid and... 
Well, or, no, he's no, he's not actually judging himself. I feel from an emotional perspective, he he's calling himself stupid, but he's not really calling himself stupid. If you reread the question, yeah, he's really saying that he did some stupid things. Yes, no, you're right. Which is he's not saying, saying that he feels stupid himself. Yeah. And in fact, he's not allowing himself to feel stupid. That's the reality. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> um, in fact, he's distancing himself from the stupid choices that he has made, in his own definition, mm -hmm. um, through that mechanism. Mm -hmm. he, he, by saying, by saying, oh, I did some stupid things. That's very different to saying I am a stupid person. Yes. So yeah, I don't feel he believes he's a stupid person. Right. He just feels that he made some silly mistakes in the last few months but he hasn't let himself feel about them and why he did them mm -hmm. which is all about the willingness again to find out why you're so unwilling <laughs> to live in harmony with love and truth yeah and this is why i feel most people f don't you know struggle on the divine love path particularly when they first begin because they they are very very unwilling <laughs> and we need to get through our own unwillingness mm. yeah okay great yeah. thanks the next question comes from someone I don't know. Yeah. No, I don't have a name. But yeah. they ask, do you have to be feeling a specific emotion when you are processing emotions? <laughs> yeah, this question is so funny. I've had it so many times in our seminars. Um, yes, of course, <laughs> you have to be experiencing or feeling an emotion if you're ever going to process through your emotions. Uh, and so, yes, it's impossible to process through any emotion if you're not feeling it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I find the f question so funny in a way because it indicates how distant people are from, the, from their emotions. They, they sort of think that processing emotion is some sort of intellectual thing, yeah. even. Yeah. No, it's not going to be any intellectual thing. It's going to be focused on feeling and experiencing the actual emotions. Mm -hmm. so, so you cannot expect to be nice and quiet and calm while you're processing an emotion. It's not like that. And it never will be like that. Yeah. And there is going to be pain and suffering in the process of feeling and experiencing these emotions because most of these emotions are error-based emotions that need to come out of you. And as a result, all error causes pain. So all error is going to, so this error as it comes out of you is going to feel painful. And you're going to have to at some point be a, allow yourself to feel pain, mm -hmm. emotionally yeah. pain, and physically pain as well. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to allow yourself to feel the physical pain in your body. You're going to have to allow yourself to feel the emotional pain that you have and allow yourself to go through the experience of it, not just the acknowledgement of it. Mm. You know, a lot of these new age people go, oh, as long as I acknowledge the emotion, then it all goes away. No, it doesn't. It doesn't go away, it's still in your soul and it will remain locked up in your soul until you experience it. And, and the reason why it's locked up in your soul is because you've got other emotions on top of it that you firstly will need to feel before you can feel the causal emotion, the actual one that will heal you. You'll have to feel all the blocking emotions that you also have, all the things that happen to you to shut you down from experiencing your emotion. And so people who ask this question are usually very shut down emotionally. Mm -hmm. And so much so that they have no understanding of what it means to actually feel an emotion. Mm. Otherwise, they would never ask the question. Yeah. Do you think we always know what the emotion, like... No. What the emotion is Definitely when we're not. feeling it? No. Definitely not. We, might, we can't na necessarily name it or where it comes from, but we are experiencing it. Yes, and, and it doesn't matter about naming where it comes from. Mm. It doesn't matter. And this is something that everyone wants to do. And it's crazy to want to do it if you think about it, because some of the emotions will have entered you before, from the age, from the time you were um, conceived through to the age of say three or four, when you didn't have a developed intellect and you have very little recorded memory of that of those events generally, mm -hmm. because they are often shut down emotionally. So, so because of these things, as you go through the emotion, you'll just be feeling an emotion. Now you might become acknowledging about it afterwards yeah. but if you're acknowledging it through it it's not you acknowledging it. it's just you've just got a spirit talking in your ear telling you what the emotions all about yeah. and honestly it doesn't help you it doesn't help you what you need to do to fully experience the emotion is to stay in the emotion for as long as it's there mm -hmm. and that requires again the exercise of your will and it doesn't matter what you intellectually believe it to be about 
and you've got to give up the idea that it's actually about thing, you know, something. Causal emotion will often, you'll find out about it only after you've processed it as to what it was about. Yeah. Now, there are groups of emotions that we manufacture. Mm -hmm. Now, these emotions are all useless to feel. Now, these kind of emotions are the kind of emotions that people experience quite frequently, which are things like rebellion, you know, anger, tantrums, yeah. crying because somebody didn't give you what you wanted, yeah. which, is a, which is out of harmony with love, yeah. and so forth. A lot of those kind of emotions are all useless emotions to actually feel because you're manufacturing them. They are not anything to do with reality or truth. They are only what you want to believe you should feel. Mm -hmm. And most people I know go through those emotions. And they, that's why, you know, a year later, nothing has changed because they're not looking at the issue of love in their emotions. Yes. So it's not just about processing emotions. It's about looking at how love and truth affects the emotion. If you're crying because somebody didn't give you something, you're not in harmony with love. So there's a deeper issue. Mm -hmm. There's a deeper emotional issue that you're not crying about yet that you'll need to find, right? And the crying about somebody not giving you what you want is all just a facade, a, a self-delusion to help you avoid what is the real pain inside of you. Yeah. And people do this frequently. So we can't assume that just because someone's even feeling emotion that they're actually processing through causal emotions. Yeah because they quite often are not. Mm -mm. And in fact, frequently are not. And they are doing the substitute emotions because they are more palatable to them to experience than the actual causal emotional pain is. Yeah. So they're using substitute emotions to avoid the causal emotional pain. Yeah. yeah. Whenever we're releasing a causal emotion, uh, I often feel there's a truthfulness about what from God's perspective about what's occurred as like it has to be done in that context like for example if I'm crying about feeling low self-worth um, but in fact I, f I feel bad because other people have treated me bad when I really get to my causal emotion I'll be crying about the fact that other people treated me bad and it hurt correct so so this whole concept of low self-worth for example is not often the causal emotion it's mm -hmm. an effect of the cause. Yep. The cause is being attacked during your childhood and being made to feel that you have no worth yep. and having a lot of pain about that inside of you once you release and fear about that inside of you. Mm -hmm. Once you release that fear, pain and shame related to those events, then you will no longer have a low self-worth. Mm -hmm. And also you'll be able to feel and experience God's love. And so you know you have worth because yeah. the biggest person in the universe loves you. <laughs> 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 and you can feel it. Yeah, and conversely, sometimes I see people crying because they feel they've been treated badly and it's all about mummy and daddy treating them badly, when in fact uh, they've actually gotten a lot of what they wanted in their childhood, which bred an expectation that Correct. they should. And what the truthful, the truthful situation from God's perspective is that they have unloving demands and expectations. Correct. And that's what they need to deal with. Correct. And so there always has to be an element of truthfulness, doesn't there? Of or, course. Or, or, not an element. There must has be, to be a truthful... Uh, it comes through the process of emotions, doesn't it? But if well, well, initially, maybe not. You know, yeah. A lot of times what we do first, and what I've noticed a lot of people who hear divine truth, what they do first is they process through all of these emotions mm -hmm. that actually are all self-delusions. Yeah. And then you tell them they haven't made any progress at all. And that's when they process their first real emotion, which is <laughs> anger. <laughs> because they're angry that the last year of their life was wasted time because they thought they were processing things that they never processed. <laughs> and when you say they're processing, then they're not really processing because we talked in our previous session about anger not being that kind of anger. Correct. It's not a, it's real, not a real process. process. But they're at least more honest with what's in their Correct. soul. Correct. Yeah. And, and they start to see their own they can start to see the fact that they haven't begun, mm -hmm. which is actually helpful. Yes. Yeah, but most people never make it beyond that point, <laughs> usually on the divine love path, particularly on earth. You know, there are so many of our friends in the first century who heard the divine truth for many years, didn't make an ounce of progress the entire time they are alive on earth yeah. until they r arrived in the spirit world in the hells and then realised the imperative of uh, being coming more sincere about their <laughs> feeling of their emotions. Yeah. 
And this is, the, this is the issue that most people on earth face now, is that unless we're more sincere about the feeling of our emotions and we're actually doing it in harmony with love, ethics and truth, then, then we'll be selecting emotions all the time that actually have no bearing whatsoever on the truth at all. So, so if yeah. maybe if I give an example of that, an example that you've already raised, and that is this example of, let's say I, I feel you don't love me. Well, the reality from God's perspective is that you don't have to love me. So if I'm crying about you not loving me, then I'm not crying about a causal emotional issue. Mm -hmm. I'm crying about an effect. Mm -hmm. There's something inside of me that has an expectation that you have to love me, mm -hmm. even though God's truth is that you don't. So the fact that I'm actually now crying about somebody not loving me is an indication that I'm already out of harmony with God's truth on that issue. Mm -hmm. Now, God's truth on the issue is that I am loved by God even if I'm loved by no one else. Now, if I don't feel that and I need somebody else to love me, then I'm in an addiction with that person, mm -hmm. right? Now, I can cry about that addiction not being met, but I'm not going to make any progress, yeah. not on the divine love path and not even on the natural love path, mm -hmm. because the reality is I have a demand upon the other person, you, that you love me. And that demand in itself is out of harmony with love. So what I would need to do is feel about why I have that demand mm -hmm. and why it is that I feel so sad when I'm not loved. Mm -hmm. And that is all about the internal sense of worth that I have. If I actually loved myself and, and, and therefore was supplying all the love that I needed for myself to myself, then I wouldn't need another person to love me, actually. Yeah. And that, you know, that's more in harmony with God's truth. Yeah, and this is where I start to get really passionate about the topic of humility. Mm -hmm. Because humi humility is a willingness to feel our emotions, but it's also a willingness to receive the truth. The truth. And so yep. what you're just explaining there, I mean, in order to process fully, we have to be open to willing uh, we have to be willing to feel our emotions, but also open to understanding the truth in relation to those emotions. Correct. And, and that's what I see most people not doing. Yeah. Most people have no desire to find out the truth about why they feel what they feel. Yes. So, for example, if I am a crying about you not loving me, and then somebody came along and said to me, actually, you're the one out of harmony with love, I'd probably go straight into anger. Mm. Because the addiction is that I want met is that I want you to love me. And I want my other friend who's coming along to tell me the truth, <laughs> I want him to tell me that you should love me. Yeah. That's yeah. what I want. Yeah. And so I get angry with him for telling, him, for telling me that yeah. you don't have to love me. Yeah. Right? So that, that's an indication that I'm still in my addiction emotion and I'm only crying because my addiction is not met, mm -hmm. which is really an expression of rage. Yes. It's not an expression of sadness at all, mm -hmm. but rather rage. Mm -hmm. And this is where we often are with our emotions. We think we're processing something when it's got nothing to do with God's truth whatsoever. Yeah. And if it's got nothing to do with God's truth, then it's highly likely that we're not processing anything. Yeah. We're just living in our delusion mm. and we're living in our addiction and our addictions are not getting met and all we're doing is expressing our rage about our addictions not getting met. <laughs> okay, so if we recap then mm -hmm. um, what you've said about processing emotions, the original question was, are we going to be feeling a specific emotion? Yeah, and the bl blunt answer to that was yes. Yes. So, and we're going to be feeling in that we'll be crying or shaking, or we'll be, Shake. it'll be o an overwhelming, Whatever the emotion is. it'll yeah. be an overwhelming experience of emotion. Correct. Yep. Our soul will go through a process of feeling and experiencing the emotion. And uh, that means that there'll be outward demonstrations of the experience. Yes. So, you know, when we, when we feel sad, if we're not having tears rolling down our face, yeah. then we're not really feeling sad. Yeah. We're just storing sad. <laughs> we're not feeling living it. In sad. We're living in sad. Yeah. We're not feeling it. Yeah. To feel an emotion, there will be an expression. There'll be the flow of the energy of that emotion in you. Mm -hmm. And it will, it will exhibit itself in both of your bodies. So if yeah. you're a spirit, it'll exhibit in your spirit body. You, know, you have tears rolling down your face in your spirit body, or if you're a person on earth, it'll exhibit it in your, in your physical body. That's the way it will be. 
Mm. And it'll always be that way. Mm -hmm. Always. Mm -hmm. That's how God made it to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're overwhelmed yes. bodily, spiritually, emotionally yes. when we're processing. Yes, but the emotion we're processing will be a truth about our life. Mm -hmm. It will not be a false thing about our life. Yep. So in other words, if I'm processing some emotion where I'm just in my expectation or demand, then that's not a truth about my life. That's, that's a lie about my life. Yep. And of course, there will be no release. Yep. And I can cry about those kind of things for the next 10 years and nothing will happen. Yep. And there are people in, this, in the spirit world who have cried like about those things for a thousand years and nothing's happened. Yep. Because they haven't processed or they are not finding the emotional truth. Rather, they are relying on the lie yep. and the self-delusion. Yeah, and... And we can just grow the willingness to find the emotional truth within us, of can't course. we? So it's not, it doesn't have to be, as this is another thing that you said uh, in, in our discussion, that it's not an intellectual process. Yes. It's, it's a willingness to find the emotional truth. And you said something beautiful that it would be in harmony with love, ethics and God's truth mm. when we're processing emotions. So if we examine this previous example that we had, where I expect you to love me yeah. and when you don't love me, I have a big cry about it. Well, that's telling me that I actually have an expectation or a demand mm -hmm. that you love me. Now, God's truth is, if I just tell myself God's truth, well, God's truth is that you don't have to love me. How do I feel about that? <laughs> yeah. Now, initially, I might feel angry about that, mm -hmm. which is processing a deeper emotion. Mm -hmm. But after I get through my anger and get into what, what I'm afraid of about that, and probably we'll start to go through fears like this emotionally. We'll, the fears will look something like, if Mary doesn't love me, then, and nobody has to love me, then I'm going to go through my life unloved. Mm -hmm. how, how do I feel about that? Mm -hmm. And then I'll start connecting to some feelings about my being unloved in my childhood. And in the case, I, it's an interaction with a woman, so... It must be some feelings that I have with my mother that I was unloved mm -hmm. that I need to actually go through and I'll start processing through that. So I won't be focusing my attention on the current relationship not where it's not working. My attention will be focused on a past experience, usually a childhood one, yeah. that I need to feel about and eventually connect to. Mm -hmm. Then I'll actually be processing, <laughs> experiencing the truth of that my emotion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we're going to be feeling it. There's going to be truth involved. And this is the power, isn't it, of exposing ourselves to God's truths, because very often it helps us cut through a lot of the self intellectual delusion stuff we want to tell ourselves about mm -hmm. our emotions. If we're willing to humbly face what God's truth is about a matter, often it connects us very well with the errors inside of us, doesn't mm. it? If we're humble. Yes, yeah. if we're humble. The final thing that you said about processing emotions is that we might not know what the exact emotion is while we're feeling it, but we will be overwhelmed emotionally. Yes. Yeah. And, and in the end, um, if you're analysing your emotion, you're not yet at the causal emotion. Yeah. Right, and the fact that we analyse all comes from fears. Yeah. So they all come from higher emotions when yep. we analyse. Yep. So every time we analyse our emotions, we're already in the fear-based emotion. Yeah. And we're already living in it. We're living in the addiction of it. Yeah. We're not actually feeling that either. Because yeah. once you start feeling the real emotions, the, you don't need to think about it anymore. You're just focused on the feeling sensations of it. You're not, you're not thinking you know, about it yeah. like anymore. And it is... It, People need to understand it's like there is a gateway into your emotions, into different emotions, mm -hmm. because there is a way that you learned how to suppress them. Yeah. And once you undo the way you've learned how to suppress them, you will automatically experience them, mm. uh, all of them. That's great news, isn't it? Yeah. Thank goodness it's not up to me and my intellect to try and root out every little emotion within me no. uh, causally. Like, the the emotion will flow just yeah. like a child yeah. once we allow its flow. Yeah. But we do need to use our will to find mm -hmm. it and find the reason why we deny it. Yeah, find all those things you mentioned and the ways we've controlled it and shut it down, don't yes. we? That's yes, that's the, the work, work you need we to, do. Have to do. The actual feeling of the emotion 
we don't have to worry about very much because when we've released enough blockages to the feeling of an emotion, the emotion will naturally flow just like it does in a child. Yeah. So we don't need to worry about getting to the actual emotion. What we need to concern ourselves about is, are we being humble to truth? Yeah. Are we desiring to love here? Mm -hmm. Are we desiring to live in harmony with God's truth and love? Mm -hmm. Are we looking at everything from God's perspective rather than our own? They are the real questions we need to focus on initially yep. because that will help us expose all the blockages. And then we can feel them yep. once we've exposed them. We can then feel them. And once we feel them, the blockages are released. Mm -hmm. And once the blockages are released, and remember all the blockages are feelings, mm -hmm. once they are released, then the causal emotion will naturally flow. It will always flow. We don't even have to worry about it. It will just come out of us, you know. And so I have plenty of times where I'm just cooking away at something and doing a meal. Or, and then all of a sudden I just start crying and away I go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and often I know what it's about because it, it, the emotion is all about something generally. But sometimes I don't even. Yeah. And I just let it go and just let it flow out of me in that moment. So that's all you need to do. Mm -hmm. Once you've released enough blockages, that's what will automatically happen. Yeah. 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 So the key is the real work we have to do is finding the blockages yes. and being willing to see them, to be truthful and honest about them yeah. and to be humble about them. Yeah. And that's the real work. And that's the work that most people don't want to engage. Yeah. God created the great system whereby our soul just feels naturally. Mm -hmm. And it's us who created all these false beliefs and fears and addictions surrounding that natural state, isn't it? Mm. So it, I kind of feel like sometimes God created the perfect process or system or creation in my soul. And then a lot of stuff got built up around it. And that's where I live far from it. All I have to do is deconstruct all these man, humankind made uh, beliefs and diversions and addictions mm. that, are, that are in the way of me just living in my soul all mm. the time. That's yeah. correct, yeah. yeah. And so that, that's really what it means to process through emotions. But um, I feel the majority of people don't want to do any of that. And that's yeah. why they keep asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't want to well, be truthful and honest about, you know, be humble, look at everything from God's perspective. Yeah. You know, we have, we have, in the course of a day, we, as you know, we have many conversations with people, all whom get upset with us generally about every conversation. Mm -hmm. Mostly it's because they're completely in their addiction and when we tell them they are, they get angry. Mm -hmm. And later on they might see it, but they initially always generally get angry. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you've really got to ask the question, do they really want to know what's going on inside of them emotionally. And I'd have to answer, no, they don't. Mm. Because when, when they have somebody tell them what's going on inside of the emotion, they completely deny it, yeah. completely. So if they're denying it with somebody telling them, they're definitely going to be denying it with God because mm. God's trying to give them a feeling about it. And, and if, if someone's right in your face telling you what the problem is and you deny it, then you're not going to be ever connect to God who, <laughs> you know, who's, yeah. you know, give it, trying to give you a feeling about it. Yeah. So of course you, you're not going to process through your real causal emotions doing that. Mm -hmm. So there are many people we feel who have listened now for five, six years or whatever. And the reality is they haven't begun this process yet. They've only heard a whole heap of divine truth, none of which has entered their heart yet because it can't enter their heart while there's so much fear and addiction in their heart. And there's a complete unwillingness for them to get real about their true emotional self and what, their, what demands are coming out of their soul and what expectations they have and how much rage and anger they have and so forth. Mm. And until you get through those barriers, you won't be processing emotion. Yeah. You'll only be feeling emotions of self-deception. Mm. Good topic for another question. <laughs> so let's <Yes>. move on. <laughs> Our next question is from Amanda mm -hmm. and she asks, quite a lot of people have heard the divine truth teachings, but almost everyone seems to find it difficult to implement in their everyday life. <laughs> is the unwillingness to feel fear the major issue? How do we develop a desire to feel fear? Um, yes, I, I don't know if I would say the unwillingness to feel fear is, a, is the major issue. Mm -hmm. um, it is one of the issues, certainly. 
But if we, if we look at the number of issues that people have with regard to divine truth mm -hmm. and progressing with divine truth, the first thing that stops us from progressing with divine truth is the inability to receive love and particularly the inability to receive love from God. So that's the very first thing. Can I ask when you say an inability to receive love, is it, it is. an unwillingness to receive love? Well, in the end it is. Yeah. It, it, okay. it, I, what I mean is this person is unable for some reason, whatever that reason is, yeah. to receive love. Sure. Now, it's not because God's unwilling to give it, because God wants to give it. So it's got to be something that's within the individual that causes them to, to not be able to receive love. Now, some people then go, well, it must be some external problem, but it's not. It's, it is definitely an internal problem. So the soul is not willing to receive God's love. So that's the first and largest problem with progressing on the divine love path. Mm -hmm. So I feel we need to emphasise that. Yeah. Fear is not that first problem, although fear may be involved in that first problem. Yeah. But it is not the first problem. The first problem is the inability of, the, of our own soul to be open to the reception of divine love. Now, how do we get our soul open? Mm. Well, we get our soul open through two ways, which we've discussed many, many times. Mm -hmm. We get our soul open by truth, mm -hmm. by being open to receiving truth, and being humble to the results of that truth, which is feeling your emotions about the truth, enter, you know, about yeah. the truth you're receiving. Now, they are the main reasons why m people do not receive God's love and therefore do not progress on the divine, uh, with divine truth. They don't progress on the path, the way that God made for us to become at one with God because of those three reasons. Mm -hmm. They are the primary reasons. Now, in amongst all of that, there are now many sub-reasons why we might do such a thing. For, for example, there are many reasons why we may block love. We might be angry with love. Mm -hmm. We might have this concept that we should only, like we shouldn't have to love or any of those kind of things, right? Yeah. Which a lot of people have. So that's anger blocking the reception of love, not necessarily fear. Although fear does drive anger, right? But anger would be perhaps the first emotion that we need to experience. Yeah. We also have many addictions about love or beliefs, false beliefs that appear real to us about love. And sure, they are fears, but again, the truth will deconstruct them mm -hmm. if we're open to receiving the truth. Mm -hmm. So we have to exercise our will to be open to receiving the truth, even from an intellectual perspective, if we're ever going to progress. So I feel the very first problem that people face is an unwillingness to receive love and also give it. Mm -hmm. That's number one. If we worked on that one problem, we would progress very, very rapidly if we were sincere. Mm -hmm. Point number two is there is a complete unwillingness to receive God's truth, to know God's truth, to even live by it in our day-to-day -day life. The majority of people who have heard divine truth are still not living by it five years later. Yeah. Still in complete denial that they're even not even living by it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, they tell themselves they're living by it because they go to a seminar or whatever, but in their day-to-day -day life, they still lie. They still mess with the truth. They don't say the truth to uh, people that are around them. When they're in situations where they feel under pressure to say truth, they, they lie or withhold the truth. This is an indication that they have a big problem with truth. And if you have a big problem with truth, you're never going to get to fear. Yeah. Fear, fear, is, fear is underneath all, all of that, but you're never going to get to it if you have a big problem with truth. And then... If you can't feel any emotion, which is humility, a part of humility, then of course you're going to struggle, even when you do hear the truth, to actually feel the unloving emotion that's inside of you that's preventing you from growing. Mm -hmm. So, so they are the three primary reasons why most people are not progressing on the divine truth path, on, yeah. the, on the way to God, to become at one with God. Fear, of course, is involved in each one of those paths. So fear is a very, very large problem on the planet. Yeah. It is a huge problem. And fear is often opposing love, yeah. opposing truth, and opposing you being humble. Right? So fear is certainly, and this is why I encourage people to list their fears, to see fear as their friend, because friend the friend tells them 
what their problems are with regard to love, truth and humility. Yeah. Every time you're afraid, it's telling you what your problems are with regard to love, truth and humility. But that's not the way most people see it. Most people, whenever they have fear, see it that they have to justify their fear, that they have to support it, that they have to work along with it. And, they, and people come to us and we say, well, you're afraid about this. They go, no, I'm not. Fair enough. What can we do after that? Yep. You think you're not? Fair enough. But you are. And while you remain so, you are not going to be open to receiving love, receiving truth, or being humble to your own emotions. So what are you going to do about that? Just keep telling yourself that you are, that you are already doing it when you're not, plainly not, and nothing's really changing? Yeah. So, so fear is certainly a problem, but it is not the major problem. I feel the major problem is desire. Mm -hmm. which fear also affects. Yeah. The major problem is that people do not have a desire to be loving. They do not have a desire to know the truth. And they do not have a desire to be humble because they see humility as weak. And if you do not have a desire to do those things, you will never, ever want to touch your fear. Yeah. So these are all things that are like wrappers that wrap up your fear. Mm -hmm. if, if, uh, so if you don't have a desire to do those three things. You wrap up your fear. It's like you make a present out of it and you hold on to it to yourself. If you develop a desire to love and to be loved and you develop a desire for truth and to speak truth, mm -hmm. to receive it and give it, and you develop a desire to be humble at all times and allow the humility of others, then you'll easily progress on the path of divine truth. But the majority of people don't do those three things. And so the majority of people find the path very, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> very hard to progress when you don't do those three things. Yeah. And fear is certainly involved with each of those things. There are certain fears that we may have that cause us to not want to love or that cause us to not want to receive love. But, uh, but generally, that fear is already wrapped up in addictions and anger. So, so the fear itself is not the problem, mm -hmm. but rather the wrappers that we've placed around the fear are the problem. Yeah. Because we're angry, we're in denial, we're angry, and we're in our addictions. And all of those things prevent us from feeling fear. Mm -hmm. And we have no desire to actually, to actually go through those things in order to get to our fear. Mm -hmm. So the second part of this question about how do I deal with my fear? Well, that's not the real question. The real question is, how do I deal with my denial? Yeah. How do I deal with my anger? And how do I deal with my addictions? Because once I deal with all of those things, I will feel my fear. Yeah. My fear will naturally come up, actually. I, I will place myself, if I'm humble and desire love and truth, I will place myself in situations where generally I feel quite terrified. Mm. <laughs> and I'll, because I'm humble, will feel the fear eventually. Yeah. As long as I get rid of my addictions, my denial, and my anger. Mm -hmm. As long as I get rid of those things, I will naturally get to my fear. Mm. So it's not really the fear that's the problem. It's the denial of the fear using techniques of addiction of and of anger to, to get the addictions met. Mm. That's the real problem. Are you willing to deal with that? And I, I answer, the majority of people are not. So basically you're saying out there, there are a lot of people who have heard divine truth mm -hmm. and the people that who've heard it and have moved on and then new people have heard it and moved many on and moved, moved on, on and, and there's moved been on tens of thousands who have heard it and moved on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then there's people out there who've heard it and they're still listening. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with Amanda saying that everyone seems to find it difficult to implement. Of course they do, but, but only because they are so far removed from those three essentials, right. from, from receiving and giving love, from receiving and giving truth, and from receiving and giving humility. Yeah. They, are, they are removed from those three essentials. And as a result, they are in their addictions the majority of the time, and they are unwilling to face their addictions. And you, you cannot get to your fear unless you are willing to face your addictions. So, so fear, yes, it is a problem. It's a huge problem on the planet, 
but it's not the main reason why we're not feeling our emotions or not progressing towards God. Mm -hmm. The main reason why is because we're unwilling to work through our addictions. Mm -hmm. We're unwilling to look at how we deny our fear, mm -hmm. how we push it down, how we, how we suppress it, how we resist it. So it's, it's all of the, the aspects of denial, resistance, all the basic things about how the human soul functions that are our, are our problem, yep. not the actual fear itself. Because you can have fear in you and still progress as long as you're open to doing these other things. Mm -hmm. The fear will naturally be felt. Mm -hmm. So it's not, fear isn't the cause of you not feeling those particular things. It's, it's certainly a participating um, factor, factor yeah. but it's not the cause. The cause is your lack of desire to actually live in harmony with love and receive love, live in harmony with truth and receive truth, and live in harmony with humility and be humble mm. and allow other people to do the same. It's interesting, isn't it? Because that's all that you ever talk about. Correct. And so people are obviously attracted to that intellectually. Yes. But emotionally, um, there's not the implementation of these principles. And so well, there's not a very strong happen. desire to implement yeah. the principles. So they love the idea of the end result, uh -huh. but they don't want to do the work that gets the end result. Yes. And this is what I find is the problem with most, uh, you know, other philosophies, new age philosophies, Christian, any religious philosophies. They say basically you don't have to do the work. Somebody else will come along and save you. Right. And the new age philosophies are all about, you know, having this technique and it's magical, you know, and it's all everyone say, no, that is not true. Mm -hmm. None of that's true. There is no magical technique here. It, it is going to have to you're going to have to exercise your will and you're going to have to exercise it in harmony with love, truth and humility if you ever want to progress. And if you're not progressing, the only reason why is because you're not doing it and you can tell yourself you're doing it, but you're not. Mm -hmm. And you can lie to yourself if you want and be, and be self-delusional or, you know, self-deceptive or whatever. But, you, but the fact that it is, if you're not making progress on the path of divine truth, it's because you do not do one of, or more of those three things. Mm. And that's the main reason why. Now, fear is a factor of why you won't do one of those three things. But it's one of many factors. There's anger, too, that causes you to not want to love. Yeah. Right? not wanted to have to tell the truth or, or not want to receive the truth. Anger causes a lot of the resistance to that. There's all of your addictions in play where you believe love to be something completely different to what it really is from God's perspective. And you want to hold on to those beliefs because they make you feel all nice and fuzzy without you having to have any sincerity or without ha having any pure motive. That's something that you want. And so you're going to have that until you decide to change that. Mm -hmm. And this is where people don't understand what's really stopping them from progressing. It's not, it's not fear, one emotion, that's stopping anybody from progressing. Fear, shame, you know, grief, any one emotion doesn't stop a person from progressing. What stops a person from progressing is a lack of pure, honest desire to love and be loved, to tell the truth and, and hear the truth and apply it and to be humble and allow the humility to be expressed by others. Mm -hmm. That's what stops you from progressing. Mm. If you do those three basic things, you will always progress. And if you think you're doing those three things and you're not progressing, then you're not doing those three things, <laughs> even though you think you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The lack of progress is a direct indicator that you're not doing them because anybody who does them, whether they live here or in the spirit world, always progresses. Great. I don't know what more you can say. I don't think we can say yeah. any more on that subject. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. Mm -hmm. How do I get past the analysing and judging of my emotions and into feeling them? <laughs> analysing and judging your emotions are driven by addiction. So the way to get past analysing and judging your emotions is to start looking at your addictions mm -hmm. to suppressing your emotions. The only reason why the mind wants to analyse an emotion is because you're addicted to, to not feeling the emotion. You don't want to feel it, right? If you wanted to feel it, you wouldn't need to analyse it anymore, <laughs> right? Yeah. Secondly, with judgement, the only reason why the mind reverts to judgement of any emotion is because something happened 
and you want to judge your emotion in order to suppress it. Mm -hmm. It's a tool that we use, in fact, to suppress the emotion. So anger starts rising, you judge the anger, it's a tool to make it go away. Yeah. Right? So it's just a tool to stop you from being humble, mm -hmm. to stop you from acknowledging the truth that the emotion exists and it's there inside of you, no matter how unpleasant you find it. Yeah. To, to stop you from wanting to be more loving. Mm -hmm. That's all it's doing. So, so the, way, the fast way to stop analysing and judging your emotions is to look at your addictions as to why you want to judge your emotion and look at your addictions as to why you want to analyse your emotion. Yeah. And then you'll find quite a lot of addictions that you have and you use them all as tools to avoid emotion. Right? That's, that, they're all just ways or methods of suppression, ways or methods of resistance, ways or methods of denial, ways or methods of substitution. Mm -hmm. That's all that they are. So, so the only way to get through judgment and being analytical is to actually look at the reasons why you automatically revert to such behaviour. Yeah. And that is an addiction. Remember, every time we're driven to a behaviour that we automatically feel we must take, for example, to analyse something or to judge it, then it's driven by an addiction. We want to analyse it. We want to judge it. So look at why you want to. Mm -hmm. That's all you have to do. Mm. Once you look at why you want to analyse and judge, you'll start seeing, oh, I've got that addiction. That's the reason why I want to analyse. I've got that addiction. That's the reason why I want to judge. You know, I want to judge and I want to analyse and that's why I automatically do it. The feeling in my soul is I've got to do that first before I feel anything. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for those things. And the fact that I revert to that behaviour means that there's quite a lot of addiction to those two things yep. occurring. So that's all we need to do. It's quite a simple process, but most people think there's far more to it than that. And they want there to be far more to it to that because the whole reason for judging is so that we can suppress our emotions. And the whole reason for analysing is so that we can suppress our emotions and select them. And feel in control of them? Totally. Yeah. We want to select We want to select them. We want to go, oh, yeah, well, yeah, that's a nice emotion. I'll have that one. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's, a lovely, that's not a nice emotion. I don't want to have that one. Yeah. That's why we analyse our emotions. Yeah. Like a person who analyses their emotion wants control. You mm -hmm. want control. You want to be controlled. That's why you do it. So it's an addiction to control. Mm -hmm. Look at why you're so addicted to control. Look at why, what's going to happen when you get out of control. What are you worried about happening when you get out of control? What are you worried about happening once you let go of judgment? Because we hold on to judgment so that we can suppress an emotion. It was a major tool used by our parents to suppress our emotion. And so we now love it as a tool to suppress our own emotion. We mm -hmm. love using that tool because it's the most effective tool. You know, you, you sit, if you sit in a room, you, if you, you try starting crying and then sit in a room with everyone in the room not wanting you to cry and judging that you're crying and you see how, how long you can cry, right? Now, the only person that can cry a long time in those situations is generally a newborn baby child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They'll cry and cry and cry and cry <laughs> until they get taken out of the room, right? But the average adult will, will not be able to even cry one tear in that environment mm -hmm. because of the judgment. Mm -hmm. right? And this is why we judge ourselves, so that we don't have to cry one tear, so that we don't have to feel one feeling of fear, so that we don't have to feel one feeling of shame. That's why we do it. So we're addicted to it, we need to stop. So whenever you've got judgment or, or any other thing stopping you from feeling an emotion, it's because you want it to stop you from feeling an emotion yeah. and you need to look at your addiction to why you want that so badly. Mm -hmm. It's really quite simple. And uh, you mentioned about someone sitting in a room where everyone's judging them. Uh, is it true then that we begin to judge ourselves in ways that we felt judged as we were growing up in, a w in an effort to of control course. those things that happened. Well, it, it, if we, we look at it from a, if we psychoanalyse the reasons yeah, why we yeah, would do such yeah, a thing, yeah, yeah. Which, which obviously is not going to help anybody feel the emotion it's necessarily, yeah, but, yeah. but let's see psychoanalyse uh, yeah, the reason okay. why we might revert to judgment. The main, only reason why we generally revert to judgment is because we used it as a tool to avoid further attack from other people. Mm -hmm. So when our parents, when we got judgment from our parents, we felt quite a lot of pain. 
So we would rather judge ourselves than receive judgment from others. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a selective tool that we've used for substitution of a more painful emotion. Yeah. That's the only reason why we revert to it. So, so we're brought up to judge in order to suppress more painful emotions. So it's a tool used to suppress causal emotions. And, and as a result, every time we're placed in a situation where that causal emotion might begin to raise its ugly head, as we feel, because mm -hmm. we're already in judgment about the emotion, right? So we're already viewing it as ugly or too painful to mm -hmm. experience. And we're already worried about what our environment is going to say about that emotion. So what we do is we go into judgment about that emotion so that everyone in our environment feels, oh, now she, that's great. You know, she feels the same way or he feels the same way as we do, you know. And this is a great way to avoid the attack of other people. It's a yeah. great way to avoid violence. Yeah. And, and so this is one reason why we've learned it, to, so that we can avoid attack from other people and avoid violence. We learn to attack ourselves instead. Yeah. And when, they, and when a person, I don't know if you've noticed, many parents, when their child attacks themselves, the parent is far more lenient on their behaviour. Yeah. And the parent is also approving, generally, of the self-attack of the child. Yeah. Because uh, it means the parent doesn't have to attack them yeah. anymore. And so most parents feel very much drawn into that kind of treatment of children. And this is one reason why judgment is self-judgment is such a big problem. Because we, we learnt that things go better for us as a child. They do go better for us yeah. when we self-punish. They do go better for us because other people stop punishing us. Yeah. You know, we no longer feel violence from other people when we punish ourselves instead. Right? So, so that's why we revert to that behaviour. But uh, it's not really good for us, is it? No, it's definitely not good for us, but we're addicted to it. Yes. It's an addiction. Yep. It's an addiction because it prevents us from feeling the real feeling, which is that somebody else was attacking us and it feels really, really bad. Mm -hmm. You know, it feels really sad and it feels terrible that we're being attacked and we're quite afraid when we're attacked. And we don't want to feel the fear-based emotions or the grieving-based emotions associated with the attack. Anybody who attacks us doesn't love us. We don't want to feel that. And so, so we revert to the self-punishment instead. We can avoid all whole groups of emotions when we revert to self-punishment. So psycho psychologically, that's why we do it. But me saying that to a person who does it is not really going to help them through it unless they go into their addiction to doing it. Yeah. They need to feel the reason why they're so addicted to doing it. Why do they want to do it? And why do they not want to change mm -hmm. that addiction? Mm -hmm. You know, because it helps them avoid deeper pain. Yeah. Self-punishment or self-judgment helps you avoid the deeper pain of other people punishing you or other people judging you. But as you just said, you just told us and we can receive that information intellectually, but it doesn't help us shift that addiction until we're willing to To actually connect feel to that emotion. the addiction yeah. and feel the fear that drives it. Yeah. Right? So the real fear that drives it is I'm terrified to be myself and I'm terrified to not judge myself anymore because that means more people around me will mm -hmm. and I'm terrified to feel all of those emotions because they feel terrible. Mm -hmm. That's the real reason. But again, we need to feel our way through the addiction first. Our desire to hold on to the judgment rather than letting it go. Mm -hmm. now, it took me years to let go of self-judgment and I still have problems with it in certain aspects. Because, because, and it's very, very hard to let go of self-judgment yeah. or self-punishment when Others you've got thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people attacking you constantly because yeah. you then start accepting their belief about you. And to prevent their belief from being felt, what you do is you construct your own belief about you. Yeah. Right? And it's much less painful than feeling their belief about you. So yeah. we've got to go through that. We've got to let ourselves feel about that, the addiction that we have to punishment and judgment, self-punishment, self-judgment in particular. Of course, some people are addicted to punishment and judgment of others. Yes. Right? And that is, a, that is even a, it's a quite a wicked thing to become addicted to that. But again, it's all avoidance of certain emotions within yourself is the reason why you do it. And, and again, you'd have to focus on your addictions, mm -hmm. not on any other thing or any other fear. Mm -hmm. You need to focus on your addiction first. Feel the addiction. Feel how wrong it is from God's perspective. 
feel the truth from God's perspective about that addiction? Would God want you to have it? Would you get into the second sphere even with it? Yeah. Would you ever be able to progress towards God with that addiction? Mm. And if we're honest with ourselves, we can easily tell what addictions we have that we're not going to get anywhere with, with God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I feel that's what we need to do with regard to punishment and judgment or self-punishment and self-judgment. And analysis, self-analysis. Yeah, well. and self-analysis is just another tool that, we, that our mind kicks into gear to, uh, to, as an addiction to avoid certain emotions. You know, most people, what they're doing, and again, we can psychoanalyze that if we want. Yeah. We can go, well, most people are avoiding that they don't know. Yeah. They're avoiding the feeling of not knowing. Yeah. And when they were a child and they didn't know, generally they got laughed at, ridiculed, humiliated, or punished. That's what happened. You know, if you think of most children's school years, they got laughed at, ridiculed, humiliated, or punished for not knowing something. Mm -hmm. When they were home and they didn't know something, they got laughed at, ridiculed, punished, humiliated, as yeah. well yeah. so they have learned that it's a terrible thing to not know and so now they use their intellect to know everything <laughs> because it's a terrible thing to not know because there's all these covered over emotions that need to be felt about not knowing mm -hmm. and this is the main reason why we revert to our mind wanting to know all the time right our mind's not capable of knowing a lot of things and most things in fact above the sixth dimension of the spirit world it's just not capable of even knowing them yeah it, need, it needs our soul to be engaged to know all those things. But, but that's not how we're taught on earth. We're taught to not engage our soul, disconnect from our soul, and to know things intellectually, and to do things intellectually, whether we agree with them or not. And we were forced into that process generally, either by society or our own parents. And so naturally, we're going to have a lot of resistance to, to feeling something that we don't know. Yeah. Uh, and that's the main reason why we want to know and analyse everything. So there's another psych psychoanalytical reason as to why we do it, but in the end, it's not going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> what will help you instead is understanding the feeling of the addiction. Yep. You need to feel the addiction you have to revert back to the mind every time. Every time you revert back to the mind, you're avoiding an emotion. Why are you doing that? What do you get out of doing that? There is something you get out. You then know, you feel safer, you feel more in control, you feel more secure. These are the emotions you're avoiding through this addiction. Mm -hmm. Feel the addiction. Feel whether it's in harmony with God's love or truth or not, and you'll get somewhere. You won't get anywhere if you just go, oh, no, I'm going to revert to analysis again. <laughs> yeah. You're not going to get anywhere because that's the go-to point for the addiction. That's what the addiction is driving you to do. Mm -hmm. And unless you're willing to feel the addiction and stop the addiction, it's just like, it's like, it's like a cigarette smoker Unless they, w if they always go and take the cigarette every single time and they carry a packet around in their pocket, of course they're not going to give up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. And it's the same with all of our emotional addictions. We're not going to give up these emotional addictions while we carry them around in our pocket all the time for use every single situation where they're triggered. Yeah. We're not going to give it up. We're going to have to learn to confront our addictions just like a smoker is going to have to probably you know, throw away his cigarettes and not carry them around in his pocket and not carry a lighter with him in his pocket and all those things that support him in his addiction. Then he's got a chance of giving up. Yeah. And, it, and if he goes through the emotions, of course, he's got a great chance <laughs> of giving up. But, but this is the thing. We can't give up any addiction while we just continue living in it. All we're doing is continue to supporting it and agree with it and we continue to, to actually justify its existence. Yep. And, and God's going to say, well, you just want it anyway. I'm not going to take it away while you want it. You can have it. <laughs> it's not helping you, but you can have it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And this is what we need to do with all these kind of addictions like judgment, punishment you know, and, and analysis and so forth and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Next question is from Pierre mm -hmm. and he asks, can we release all the causal emotions and errors without the help of God and his operation of grace? No. Simple answer. Um, the reason why that is the case, we have many causal emotions of error relating to God. Uh -huh. So without a connection with God or, or a challenge of the connection with God, we are not going to release those emotional errors. And actually every sixth sphere spirit has a whole group of emotions relating to God that they've yet to touch and release. Mm. 
and that's the reason why they're six sphere spirits and not in the seventh sphere mm -hmm. because there's all these causal emotions relating to God so the answer is no you cannot progress um, without you know uh, in any way uh, particularly if you want to be a come at one with God without addressing all of your causal emotions, which include all the causal emotions you have with God, yeah. in your relationship with God. So we can uh, forget, we can't progress beyond the sixth sphere until we deal with those Correct. final emotions. Correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so we can't have infinite progress unless we begin to address those particular emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting question in a sense, because a lot of people want to be able to progress beyond the sixth sphere without God. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are many sixth sphere spirits who are very much engaged in wanting to progress beyond the sixth sphere without God and wanting to do it through the use of their intellect yeah. and wanting to develop their intellect further and develop their own love, the natural love within themselves further to progress into the seventh dimension. It's not possible. Nobody's ever done it and nobody will. Yeah. Because the flavor of love that exists in the seventh dimension is such that it requires some of God's love in the soul to live there. Mm -hmm. And that means dealing with your emotional injuries with God. Great. Mm. Next question is also from Pierre and mm -hmm. it links to the prior question. Okay. okay. So is it correct that we can grieve and release causal emotions with the help of natural love emotional release techniques and without involving God? It is true that we can release some causal emotions using all sorts of techniques to do so, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. but you're not going to release them all. To release them all, you need to involve God because many of your emotions are about God. Mm -hmm. So you will need to involve God in the process of the release of them all. Mm -hmm. You can release some in this process. And in fact, every sixth sphere spirit who's ever progressed to the sixth sphere has released some. Yeah. through a process, some of which has taken many, many thousands of years, other times taking usually tens of years. But it's a process that they go through, either attempting to suppress their own loving emotions or by feeling them. They choose to do either. Yeah. Now, some of them have chosen to suppress them and others of them have chosen to feel them. Now, the ones that choose to feel them are very different in terms of the, in the sixth sphere than the ones who have chosen to suppress them. But the reality is they still have quite a lot of causal emotion revolving around God mm -hmm. and their relationship with God that they still need to address and they are refusing to address in that point, at that point. Yeah. So while they have been perfected in the expression of their love towards their fellow man, they have no perfection whatsoever when it comes to their love with God, mm -hmm. receiving or giving it. Mm -hmm. And that's what they would need to work through if they wanted to progress beyond the sixth dimension. Mm. Okay. Mm. Okay, another question from Pierre. Mm -hmm. kind of, it's a kind of a set of a three mm -hmm. questions that all link together. No worries. If I'm humble and in truth, mm -hmm. and if I can release my causal emotions without the help of God and get to a sixth sphere condition without God, mm -hmm. would that be called the quickest natural love process not involving God? Mm -hmm. And if God is involved, would the process be quicker or more enjoyable or more efficient? <laughs> and if so, could you explain why and how? All right, let me look at all of these things. Uh, <laughs> well, do you want me to talk you back through them? Well, no, let's go. Yep. There, there's a, a number of interesting statements in this question. Yep. He's first saying, if I am humble and in truth, yeah, and if I can release my causal emotions without the help of God. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're humble and in truth, you would never try to release your causal emotions without God's help. Mm. Because humility would demand that you would have God's help, <laughs> actually. Yeah. And if you were in truth, you'd realise that a lot of your causal emotions are revolving around God. Right? So, yeah, <laughs> so, so in that you're saying if you're humble, then you're going to be open to truth and new ideas and seeking that, in fact. And so Not God only that, would be you're your going to be open one. to God. Yeah. And if you're in truth, you'll be open to God. Yeah. It's only people who are not humble and not in truth that choose the natural love path. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah. so the question sort of doesn't really make sense in a way, but we need to address the reasons why it doesn't make sense, yes. right? Yep. So par part of it, this whole idea that you can be humble and in truth and yet not be connected with God, well, that's not true. 
if you're not connecting to God, you're not, in hum you're not being humble and you're not in truth. Because mm -hmm. the truth is God created the entire universe. Like you, you're missing out the biggest picture of the universe when you miss out God. Yeah. And the reality, so it's the biggest truth you're missing out, by the way. And if you're not humble, then, you, then you're not humble to every emotion. And that means you're not humble to every emotion that involves God. So, so how can you say on one hand you're humble and in truth, while at the other hand saying that you don't want to connect to God? Mm -hmm. uh, the two are not in hand in hand with each other, yep. actually. So I think the point of the question he's asking, though, is can you go through a, you know emotional process in order to arrive in the sixth fear? Yes, you can. Yeah. There are many spirits who have gone through this process as I've learnt to progress quite rapidly to the sixth fear by going through an emotional process of releasing certain emotions. Mm -hmm. But the emotions they allow themselves to release, because they're not completely humble to all emotion, yep. are the emotions that don't involve God. Yep. <laughs> Yep. So there are emotions that involve their fellow man and their relationship with fellow man and so forth. And that's why they become perfected in natural love, the love that comes out of them, but not perfected in their relationship with God. So, so it is possible to progress to the sixth dimension using two methods. One, suppressing all of your emotion, yep. which, is the sti which is still the preferred method by most people who, who arrive in the sixth sphere. And then there's this second method, which would be by processing through your emotion in the manners that we've described. Of course, you wouldn't be processing through the emotions relating to God. Otherwise, you would have been open to God before then. Yeah. And you would have progressed beyond the sixth fear. Yeah. So you're humble to certain emotions. Mm -hmm. In fact, almost all emotion except where it relates to God. Yeah, see, I wouldn't classify all emotions except where. The yeah. reality, the percentage of emotions that we have that relate, that to, relate God. to God far exceed the percentage of the emotions that we have that relate to any other being. This is the reason why we're so blocked to God. Yeah. And, and the reality is that the majority of us, if we had to analyse the percentage of emotions that are within an individual relating to other people and relating to God, it's heavily in favour of, in, when I say heavenly favour of God, what I mean is the majority of our unhealed emotions relate to God. Yeah. And a minority of our unhealed relation, emotions relate to other people. Yeah. This is why the majority of people who have progressed to the sixth dimension have no real, no connection with God. Yeah. And also no even connection with their own self emotionally really. Yeah because they've had to suppress a large number of emotions in order pr to progress to the sixth dimension without God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what they have to do. So, so you will process the minority of your emotions by, by, you can process the minority of your emotions by going through this emotional process to become, you know, into the sixth dimension of the spirit world in terms of perfected in your natural love. But there will still be the majority of your emotions to process through after that point yeah. relating to God. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Right. And so it often it takes a person many, many years after they've reached the sixth fear to reach the seventh, if they've progressed using any method. Any method that doesn't involve that God. That doesn't involve God. Because as we progress through the spheres involving God, then we are dealing with emotions that relate to God the whole time, Correct. aren't we? Correct. Correct. And so it's almost like we're getting through the bulk of the work as we go. Correct. Whereas someone who enters the sixth sphere, they've like concerted effort, deal, become perfect in natural love, but mm. not from what you're saying, not taken into account any of these other emotions. And so Correct. this transition from six to seven is actually got pretty bulk. There's a lot of work in involved of in it. Work. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's one further thing we should say about it though, and that is that the person who's progressed using their emotions to reach the sixth sphere, once they begin to focus on their relationship with God, will probably qu progress quite rapidly towards God after that point. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is they're not shut down towards their emotions. Yeah. Whereas a person who's progressed to the sixth dimension by using their intellect primarily and, and forcing their emotions to conform to their intellect, they will struggle immensely with the progress towards God after that point because they've yet to learn the secret of emotional work. Mm -hmm. And so that as a result of that, they are going to have far more struggles after they've reached the sixth dimension to connect to God. 
than the person who's progressed to the sixth dimension by processing through their emotions to get there. Yeah. So it would certainly be, if it'd be better for the person who's progressed through their emotions after they've reached the sixth dimension to reach the seventh than it would be for a person who hasn't processed through their emotions at all okay. and rather suppressed their emotions and controlled their emotions and used their intellect to dominate themselves, they are going to find it much more difficult to yeah. make the transition. Okay. Mm. If we get then to the final part of Pierre's question, mm -hmm. which is um, if God is involved, would the process be quicker or more enjoyable or more efficient? <laughs> Well, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> the it's process. So wide, he wants to know. <laughs> well, yeah. well, firstly, it's it's more enjoyable because you're receiving some of God's love while it's happening. Yeah. So there's love coming from a powerful external source that's entering your soul as you make each trip, if you like, as you make each step up the ladder of progress. You're receiving love from God, and when you receive love from God, you go through these beautiful moments of incredible peace and. And, and beautiful feelings of love as a result. And so naturally, you, you will find it far more enjoyable mm -hmm. than you would have done uh, doing it using another method without God. Yeah. So that's firstly. Secondly, he's, uh, he said, whether, asked whether it's quicker. Well, of course it's quicker. Anything that involves God is going to be quicker because you've got God feeding you truth. Yes. And that means you don't have to go through an experimental process with other people or with the universe itself in order to discover that truth. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and the beauty too of receiving some of God's love is it sensitizes your heart. It turns your heart from a heart of a rock or yeah. a stone into the heart of flesh. Yeah. You know, something that's malleable, something that something can sensitive. flow into, sensitive. Yeah. And so obviously you're going to become more sensitive to truth more rapidly mm -hmm. if you progress, you know, you, with God. And then the third part of the question was, um, more efficient well of course it's more efficient because it involves god <laughs> you're involving the person who created everything rather than just the creation of everything yes and so as a result now that you've got some kind of direct communication occurring albeit sporadically as you're progressing mm -hmm. it's better than having no communication with god at all yeah and naturally it's going to be far more efficient mm -hmm. so the fastest thing to progression on is to engage God right from right this moment, yeah. right from this moment. So it doesn't matter whether you're in the hills or you're in the second sphere, you're in the sixth sphere, right from this moment, now that you know you can engage God, engage God in this progression and work through first all of the reasons why you're blocked towards God. Do that first. That's the most efficient thing to do because if you do that, then all these other truths will come to you and you'll easily be able to progress using that method. So, so it's very, very important to understand that the progress towards God, if it's really engaged in the way that we're teaching, it will be smoother, more efficient, more enjoyable and quicker and easier. Yeah. Now, if after five years, none of those things have happened for the majority of people who are listening, it means I've not engaged the process at all. Yeah. Right? Not at all. Yeah. And that's OK. Yeah. There are, but that's important for them to see. You know, it's important for them to see that they've been using their intellect still. They've still got these blocks towards love, blocks towards truth, blocks towards humility. That's where they need to focus their attention mm -hmm. rather than focusing their attention on any new agey philosoph philosophical thing or focusing their attention on more analysis or focusing their attention on trying to get more truth or of some kind that's not from God but from some mystical process. Fo focusing on mysticism and, and focusing on wanting to feel good through the process, which is a part of the problem, obviously. Yes. If you want to feel good through the process, <laughs> you won't feel good very often. <laughs> Um, because you're going to be using your addictions mostly and every time you engage your addictions, you're going to have more pain. So, so the reality is if we involve God in a pure sense that's honest and truthful and sincere in our longings, then of course we will progress very rapidly. The only reason why anybody does not progress rapidly is because they're not doing that. Mm -hmm. right? Now, I find the majority of people progress very slowly. When I say very slowly, it takes them hundreds, if not thousands of years to progress. Right? The majority of people on earth in particular. It's a bit easier in the spirit world sometimes, particularly once you start reaching the second or third sphere because you, you don't, you're not surrounded by the hells 
yeah. all the time. And so therefore you're not influenced negatively all the time. Whereas on Earth, because you're surrounded by the hells all the time, you're influenced negatively frequently unless you actually deal with things emotionally. So it's, it is sometimes harder on Earth to progress, but there's this other part of Earth progression, which is fantastic, which is you have to have a very strong desire to progress on Earth to actually progress. And once you engage your desire with that power, you'll find the spirit world a breeze. <laughs> you know, you'll find it very easy. So, so there are advantages of, of each way of progressing. And, and God obviously designed us to progress on the Earth anyway. So my suggestion to people is to give up the concept of trying to process their emotion without involving God. You can do it if you wish, but at the end of the day, you're far better off involving God in all of these engagements. And it, it's the relationship with God that will keep drawing you. Mm -hmm. one, you know, once, if, if you don't have a relationship with God, you will not be drawn beyond the sixth dimension anyway. You will not. You'll find it very interesting yeah. and life very interesting, but it won't be the fulfilling and everlastingly progressive life that it could be. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mm.